if I tell you I have asthma, you will be going nothing lah. You get asthma, just take your puffers. If I tell you I have HIV, you will see me in a very different light. I'm Dr. Lo Jia Shen. Uh, I practice in an infectious disease specialist group. We have uh, uh, some clinics in the private hospitals. I run three of the clinics in Farrer Park Hospital, uh, Mount Elizabeth Novena Hospital, and Glen Eagles Hospital. The word HIV um, actually means the virus. The V stands for virus. So AIDS is the condition. So uh, by nomenclature, one is the virus, one is the condition it causes, right? So HIV infection is actually a, a very long infection. From the time the person gets it to the time the person manifests with AIDS, which is the end stage of HIV infection, it can take anything from 7 to 10 years. So uh, events that happen after contracting HIV is as follows. Upon catching HIV, the body tries to fight it. And most of the time, the body is successful after two weeks, two to four weeks. And after that fight, uh, the body will be able to control the HIV to a lesser, a lower level, but at a cost. And the continued fight with HIV and HIV continuing in the body untreated depletes the body immune system. And over about seven to ten years of continued depletion, the body enters the final stage of total immune paralysis, which is called AIDS. Lah. That means the immune system is so severely weakened that uh, rare infections now have a chance to, to catch hold. So that stage is called AIDS. Specifically, AIDS is defined when the person's CD4 count is less than 200. HIV is of course transmitted through uh, vertically mother to fetus, blood born, either through transfusion or, or, or through sharing of needles from drug addicts and of course the most common by far is sexually lah. So cure is difficult uh, because from the time a person is infected with HIV to the time it's diagnosed, usually many few many years have elapsed. Yeah? So it, during this time, in fact very 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 early on in the infection, the HIV virus seeks out and establishes latent viral reservoirs. And in, and in some of these latent uh, viral reservoirs, the virus is not actively replicating. So they are hidden cells, they are not actively replicating. A lot of um, antiviral drugs tend to be very effective in hitting cells that are actively replicating. So if they are not in fact, you know, chemotherapy works on the same concept. If things is actively replicating, it hits harder. If it's latent, first of all, it's you have to detect it, find it, then target it. And um, that's the first difficulty. Yeah. As though that's not hard enough. The second difficulty is that the genome of the HIV virus integrates itself into the host. So the virus becomes part of the host DNA via the enzyme integrase. So now, not only it is hard to find, it has become part of the population. So how do you extract out this part of the human DNA? It becomes part of DNA. So, so now that, that's double the difficulty. Lah. So as time goes by, this reservoir grows. Early research shows that if you hit very early, when the reservoir is very small, potentially you can catch it, but few studies have shown success in this approach, few studies. Um, but the, the idea that you can hit it so early that there's no time to establish a reservoir is valid, which is why there's such a thing called post-exposure prophylaxis. That means after a very, very, very high risk activity like um, condomless uh, sex with uh, sex worker, people can take HIV medication immediately after because then you block the virus even before it has time to set foot and establish a reservoir. So once they establish a reservoir, it, it's hard to effect a cure. You just walk into any clinic, go into any GP clinic, they can take your blood and set it off. And in fact, the blood is a little bit of blood, it's very little. So anybody who is high risk factor for HIV uh, should get themselves tested, of course. Anonymous testing is possible. 
but uh, I don't think they are increasing the number of anonymous testing sites now. So I, I think it's harder and harder for clinics to get into the anonymized testing. There will always be cure research, right? The cure research will never stop. Actually, one of the most exciting thing about the cure research uh, may not actually be the cure. One of the most exciting thing about the cure research is along the way, we learn and develop technologies to investigate different aspects. So it's the journey to the cure that is teaching us so much. Such that maybe by the time we effect the cure, it's, it, it may no longer be important. To, to give you some example, HIV went from three, four years ago to is that 400 new cases a year. Then it came up with 300 new cases a year. This last year, because of all the shutdown and people not being able to move around, just slightly over 200 cases a year. So, first cure is very important, but few people realize that the journey to the cure has taught us so much. This goes on, goes back to one of the early trials uh, uh, called in, in, published like I think five years ago. So the trial actually says that the earlier you start treatment for HIV, the more likely it is that this person will live a normal life. There's even a trial that is so ambitious in saying that if you start HIV treatment early, before the CD4 count drops to less than 500, the person reaches a normal life expectancy and in some cases exceed. Now that's, that's hard to explain. Why would a person with HIV live longer than a person without HIV? And some authors believe that the person with HIV is being monitored like a hawk by the IV infectious disease physician. If he's smoking, he's not allowed to smoke. If he's drinking, he's not allowed to drink. If he's not 50, he's allowed to, he's uh, encouraged to go for screening. Essentially, these people are on follow-up pretty much lifelong locally. So that could be one of the reasons. So these people, yes, they can live normally. They can go to work, take holidays, eat with normally, exercise normally. Um, even if you are HIV positive, if uh, your viral load is controlled, which is easily achieved more than 90% of the time, if you take your medication, then you can even have children with a HIV negative partner and not infect the HIV negative partner and not infect the child. Even if the mother is the one with HIV, it is possible, actually it's not even possible, it's better than possible. It's routine care that the fetus is born without HIV. You know, it's not, it's no longer something to uh, acclaim or exclaim or shout about anymore. So essentially, yes, they, some HIV patients uh, tend to have, uh, tend to take some older HIV medication, they tend to suffer some side effects. Some of these can be, some of these side effects can be quickly uh, improved or done away with by upgrading their regimen to modern day regimen. Right, modern day regimen are safer, less pills and uh, lesser side effects. Uh, and the HIV patients do have a higher chance of cardiovascular uh, 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 morbidity, uh, heart diseases, but if they keep their secondary prevention methods uh, really top-notch, that means they get screened, they stop smoking, they keep their healthy body weight, exercise regularly, and their doctors will be nagging them for all these chronic uh, illness prevention methods, and essentially they do very well. This actually happens quite a lot around the world. This is, in this condition is what we call zero discordant couple. Uh, I assume this question means that your partner has HIV and you also don't have HIV, right? Uh, if you also have HIV, then it's not that big a problem. So if you do have HIV, your partner has HIV. So this is called serial discordant. So what happens? First thing, we to, to show the signs, uh, there's this uh, recent dogma called U equals U. U equals U. The first U means uh, undetectable. Undetectable viral load in the positive patient equals untransmissible. So, the trial didn't say that if the virus load of the positive patient is undetectable, the person has a low risk of transmission. The trial didn't say that. They say that if it's undetectable, they are so ambitious that they say they have a zero risk of transmission. <laughs> they go as far as to say the risk is zero, not low. 
zero. So this is this is an earth shattering, it's an earth shattering statement to make, um, and people have uh, accumulated tens of thousands of episodes of uh, intercourse, of sexual intercourse, and, and found no transmission if they are. In those studies where they find transmission, either the transmission has happened out of relationship, that means <laughs> the zero neg the negative one caught it from somebody else, or the positive one um, is not suppressed, his viral level is not suppressed. So that's the first thing. So you can live normally. Then the second thing is, uh, I think most important, uh, hence knowing this, the negative partner should be very encouraging to the positive partner to take his medication to and to make sure the viral load is suppressed. So that's the the technical part, which is easy the easy part to do. The second part is hard to do is the support. Is the support is the destigmatization is the treating the HIV person as a normal person. It is fighting back the entire tsunami of uh, societal stigmatization in a person with HIV. It is sad to say that right now, if I tell you I have asthma, you will be going nothing lah. You asthma, just take your puffers. If I tell you I have HIV, you will see me in a very different light. So this is uh, this is the much harder part to 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 overcome. So if you are living with someone, I think showing a lot of support, a lot of understanding is very important.